person. And for okay, people Vinny. who don't I, know I, what we're talking about, Vinnie Politan was on a show, and uh, he had a rant for about 20 minutes about Jody Arias, why she should be on death row. So and look, Vinny, that's who. Vinny is, Vinny's a hell of a nice guy. He's a former prosecutor. Uh, you know, he's in session, HLN, and, you know, I've been on with him many times. And, and, and Vinny's great. Uh, but to set the stage properly, uh, it was an uh, opening episode of Vinny's podcast. And, yes, it's very pro-prosecution. Um, and there's certainly a market for that. Um, and, you know, God bless him. You know, like I said, everyone's got some type of agenda. And, you know, Nancy Grace, who I've been on with many times, um, you know, there, there's a little secret, and we'll keep it between us, but Nancy's really a lovely lady and a sweetheart. But she yes. has a position and a stance that she takes, and, you know, that kind of personifies her on air. Um, and, and I think Vinny's kind of doing the same thing. Um, Jody is still a very polarizing uh, topic. Uh, there's very strong views on both sides, and, you know, people listening tonight are going to fall on, on both sides. Uh, people tend to have more extreme views. And, you know, that was uh, a lightning rod for, for Vinny to uh, get started with. Now, you know, injecting the opinion that all defense attorneys lie because um, they will tell a jury that the, uh, the prospect of someone serving a life without parole sentence um, is worse than a death sentence. Well, you know, again, this is a process. The judicial system is a process. And if you're really an advocate of the system, you support the process and not the outcome um, because that's what the you know, judicial system is based upon in this country. You know, it's a constitutional system. Uh, in particular, there, there's due process. If you don't like it, go to Mexico. See how it works out for you down there. Um, Try right, living in uh, that jail cell for a day, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, again, I'm sure that'll work out really well for you. But, you know, there is a presumption of innocence. And, you know, the system isn't perfect. You know, I, I've seen it for a long time. Um, truthfully, there are guilty people who walk. And there are some innocent people who who go to jail. Um, and we've seen plenty of people freed off death row for, you know, a variety of mistakes. But I, but I think the key is to respect the system, you know, its integrity, and to really try hard and to get it right. And if this is a situation, um, you know, in a death penalty case where someone does get life and, you know, that's how a jury feels, well, that's the process. And if a prosecutor and a former prosecutor like Vinny is – you know, um, pretty asked off about it, you know, it comes back to picking your jury. Do a better job of picking your jury. So, you know, who does it ultimately come back on? But, you know, again, he he had a good lightning rod topic. Kudos to him. I wish him success in the podcast. And, um, you know, I just wonder if he'll uh, let me drop some F-bombs like you do if I'm ever on with him. Uh, I guess we'll hey, do it. You, you know, you're, you're welcome to say anything. <laughs> well, I, I know uh, it makes a great radio. Un- and, if we recall. and by the way, the people that are sending these things uh, on on Twitter at me have the balls to call up and say what you want to say at 347 857 2950. Don't talk the talk without walking the walk. So, and, and George, uh, because we, we are trying to be a little bit more uh, filtered tonight, right. um, if, instead of saying if they have the balls, if they are sufficiently uh, endowed <laughs> in the uh, testicular area, come on, we're going to work right. on this together tonight. We're going to you know, try and make this a little bit more of a family show if it's the last fucking thing we do tonight. Um, <laughs> no fucking way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I gotta tell you, Jordan. I gotta tell you, Jordan. My daughter's sitting right next to me, like right now, and she just looked at me and said, "What is wrong with you? Don't worry." Honey. <laughs> oh it's my dramatic. God! If she only knew. <laughs> oh my God! Wow, well, she, she's old enough, I assure you. She's uh, she's sixteen, and uh, yeah, she gets it. So, what else okay. we got happening tonight? We got a very interesting story in my in my neck of the woods. We have a Brooklyn district attorney recommending a house arrest, no jail time for the former NYPD Peter Lang who killed somebody. Here's the story. We'll talk on the other side. Brooklyn District Attorney Kenneth Thompson is recommending house arrest but no jail time for ex-NYPD cop Peter Liang. He was convicted of fatally shooting an unarmed man in the stairwell of a housing project. 
Thompson argues there are mitigating circumstances that favor probation. The fact that Liang was a rookie cop with less than a year on the street, that he was patrolling a darkened stairwell to try and keep the residents of the pink houses safe, and that there's no evidence that he intended to kill 28-year-old Akai Gurley, who was two floors below. Liang fired one round that ricocheted off a wall and struck Gurley in the chest, killing him. He was violating NYPD protocol by having his finger on the trigger of his service weapon when there was no immediate threat posed to him or his partner, Sean Landau. Thompson suggests an appropriate sentence for Liang would be six months of house arrest, 500 hours of community service, and five years probation. Liang was fired from the force immediately after a Brooklyn jury convicted him of manslaughter February 11th. Jason Lamb, unbelievable. Uh, you know, in some some parts of Brooklyn, uh, smoking a joint would get you that sentence. Your thoughts on uh, this as the family cries? Well, I think we need to take uh, kind of the 30,000-foot view on this one, Jordan. Um, yes. You know, Officer Liang was a rookie. This was a manslaughter, not a murder. Murder is the intentional killing with or without premeditation. Uh, manslaughter is a crime of rec- recklessness, and this is a case where we had a rookie officer who was in a dark stairwell, and he had his finger on the trigger. That's a violation right. of policy when there's no imminent threat. Now, we've had a lot of in- issues and incidents over the last couple of years in this country, you know, whether it was in Cleveland, Baltimore, Ferguson. And, George uh, Zimmerman. Cops are really, cops, cops are, it's, every, it's rampant. You know, right. and cops are under the microscope. Uh, Ferguson, right. But, sure. But this is a situation where Officer Liang um, broke policy. Um, and, you know, there's differing opinions on, on gun safety in that regard. But I will tell you that as a criminal defense attorney who has represented numerous police officers charged with serious felony offenses, it is a very big to charge a cop for acts performed in the line of duty. And, you know, the sentiments have changed in this country where, you know, um, you know, police are, you know, frankly, on trial every day, you know, they put on their badge. So, you know, we've got to start out realizing this is a crime of recklessness. It wasn't anything intentional. But the Brooklyn DA made a conscious decision to charge the officer with a criminal offense that, if convicted, would end his career and possibly put him in prison for a very long time. It was that serious. But now, when the officer is convicted, they're just telling the judge, give him a slap on the wrist. Give him a little bit of house arrest and some community service. Give him a free pass. So it's serious enough to charge the officer such that he could be put in prison but then you want to give him a pass at the back end, and it kind of makes me wonder. And I'm sitting, you know, three thousand miles away. Was this a public relations stunt gone bad yeah, from you Brooklyn know what? DA? That sounds like it. <laughs> it's just, you know, you, you gotta wonder: is it serious enough to charge a cop? But you really, right. you know, don't want much to happen to him. Was this to calm the public, to appease the public? And I'm not saying that, you know, the death wasn't tragic, because every death is tragic. You know, whether sure. a cop is involved, whether it's, uh, you know, a drug deal gone bad, you know, the hundreds of murders that happen every week in this country that we just don't hear about. You know, it's a tragedy, and, you know, people feel the pain and people feel the loss. I'm not trying to minimize anything about this situation, but you kind of got to wonder what the DA's motives were, you know, and, you know, it's a valid point to make. And right. Of, of course, the police unions, they get upset when officers are charged. Um, you know, and it creates a lot of friction also in a, in a close call case like this where there's rec- recklessness um, as opposed to intentional conduct. You know, do the cops feel that the prosecutors are backing them up? So there's a lot of internal conflict. There's a lot of complexities here. Uh, and, and yes, that that DA's recommendation w- w- was kind of surprising under the circumstances. But at the same time, yes, I mean, have you uh, ever seen a DA offer that after being convicted? I mean, maybe you know before something like that, and it's it's just 
I can't I can't wrap my head around it. I mean, the paper's you know, going crazy around here because it, you know it's in this neighborhood. Uh, it, it's just very wild, <laughs> to say the least. You know, I, I could see a plea agreement being worked out to a probation offense um, if there was an agreement before trial, and you know, all parties thought it, it, it was best. But, you know, and I can only speak to uh, Arizona law because I'm licensed here. I'm not licensed in New York. When we have a an offense right. with a gun, um, it's mandatory prison. And, you know, every state's different. Every state has, you know, different um, codes and rules and penalties and whatnot. But it's mandatory. If you're convicted, you're taken into custody at the time of the verdict, you're going to prison. And that's it. It's not, it's not for the, you know, DA just to... Um, give you a, you know, uh, a sweetheart recommendation. So this is something I, I would expect maybe as part of a plea if there were some mitigating or extenuating circumstances. Um, but to do the whole dog and pony show and then, um, yeah, kind of kind of shoot your load on a you know on a probation recommendation, something doesn't smell right. No, I mean, do you think that this district attorney thought that maybe, you know. Part of him morally felt that he was somewhat justified. He's a cop, you know. He's not the, you know, he was a rookie. Do you think he thought as maybe a juror afterwards? Well, if he thought all these mitigating circumstances were there, then then work out a deal in the beginning. That doesn't mean that you know the officer or any other defendant has to take a deal. You know, they have the absolute right to trial. But um, maybe he was trying to make peace with the police union. I don't know. But the off the DA certainly, you know, thought that the officer committed a crime. Um, he found there was sufficient evidence. He made a conscious decision to to charge the case. But um, yeah, it's an odd turn of events. Yes, one you will not see uh, too many uh, in this lifetime. I mean. It's, it's it's just so odd. I, I you know, speechless. And they they showed the family here. It that's the people I really feel bad for. Uh, well, sure, the family was taken on a ride. I'm sure. I mean, I, I'm sure they feel that they were somewhat deceived because the DA is you know representing that you know hey we have a sufficient case you know to bring homicide charges against an officer and they're very invested. Emotionally, and I'm sure they feel deceived. I'm sure they feel let down, and they feel disappointed. Because, like I said, you know, they're victims of a tragedy, whether it was criminal or whether it was an accident. You know, they lost someone, and, and they feel that pain. And perhaps they feel that it was, you know, all for naught, given the DA's recommendation at this point. No question. Let's go to uh, the Jared Fogel uh, incident. Here's a clip, and we'll talk. Convicted pedophile and ex-subway pitchman Jared Fogel was pummeled in a vicious prison yard attack, according to a new report. The beatdown was delivered by convicted armed robber Stephen Nigg during a January 29th incident at a Colorado low-security prison, according to TMZ. The 60-year-old Nigg tackled Fogel during a brawl in the facility's recreation yard and pummeled his face. The disgraced Indiana sex offender suffered a swollen face, scratched neck, and bloody nose, while Nigg walked away unscathed, the report said. It isn't clear why exactly the attack took place. It isn't unclear why the attack took place. <laughs> Did you catch that last part? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it sounds like uh, somebody was trying to give Jared a foot long. But, uh, uh, yes, yes, time. let's talk about that. Is this, look, you know, a lot of people are going to say, yes, he's a pedophile, he deserves this. But the man serving his time, I mean, how do you look at it? Well, the, the first thing is it's somewhat unusual for sex offenders to be housed in general population. Uh, there are various right. standards of the American Correctional Association that dictate proper housing and management uh, of inmates, and a big part of that is their classification. Um, there has been a trend, uh, oh gosh, over the last decade or more to keep, uh, you know, sex offenders separate for their own protection, yet uh, Subway Jared 
uh, was in, you know, on the mainline population. So that's a little bit odd. 